Chris. <laughs> A-Hole Productions. Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to our first episode of Nemeseek, uh, which is my Resident Evil kind of commentary show. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, essentially record commentaries for all the movies, the six live action movies and the three CGI movies. Um, but I'll also, you know, most likely do something similar for the video games. Um, probably not in order. I think I'm going to start with Res Evil 2. And I have a bunch of footage of those, uh, mainly because I already kind of covered Res Evil 1. Uh, what I did was I spliced together a version of Res Evil 1, the video game, the remake. And I spliced it together where I combined Chris scenes and Jill scenes, almost like cutting back and forth, as if it was telling one cohesive story. And uh, you were seeing when, you know, Chris was on one side of the mansion, Jill was on the other. And so I kind of, you know, have an edit of that already out, and I'll put a link to it down below if you want to go check that out. So since I've already kind of done that, and I don't want to redo that, and I'm mainly sticking to the remake universe of the video games, now that we have the second remake out, and the third one coming out soon, I figured, you know, I'll show some gameplay footage in future episodes of me playing those games and doing essentially commentary tracks for the video games uh, in sections, uh, including DLC and everything. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoy what this series is. I just wanted to do something different out there that a lot of people weren't doing consistently. Like I know there are other people out there that recorded audio commentary tracks for Resident Evil and, and some of these other uh, stuff that we're going to talk about and they do let's plays of the games but for me you know I'm such a fan of the lore of Resident Evil and I rarely see that in some of these gamers out there and these other channels that cover Resident Evil they have more like at least the people I watch are more like strategy based they come up with good strategies on how to get past certain zombies or use the least amount of ammo for certain areas or getting through an area without getting hurt or speed running and those are typically the channels I kind of watch and so because of that I wanted to create a type of content that maybe they don't uh, and get into the stuff that I like which is you know filmmaking video game making talking about behind the scenes stuff the actors and actresses that play the characters in the games and the movies um, the people who produce and direct the movies and games uh, where the games come from where the movies come from the different versions of the movies that there was going to be all that kind of stuff so that's what we're going to do here so I would say if you want to listen to this as a podcast you probably could but I'm going to be referencing at least the movie the first movie that came out starring Mila Jovovich and Michelle Rodriguez which came out in 2002 directed and written by Paul W.S. Anderson and uh, we're going to start that movie here so when I tell you to hit play if you're watching the movie I would say go get the movie you know if you're not watching it and you want to you can go get the movie and you can start it right when I say start and then we're going to go through this movie together and I'm going to talk about it and reference things and as things pop up on screen I'm going to react to them and talk about them um, whether they're references to the game or not you know we're going to go through all that so that's what we're going to do here tonight it's it's really late it's uh, midnight on uh, January 20th 2020 and I just figured, you know what, January around this time usually is when the last two Resident Evil games came out, and I've been in a big Resident Evil mood, and I've, I've seen all the hype for the Resident Evil 3 remake coming up, so I've been wanting to do this kind of show for a while, but I was trying to think of a format, and so podcast is the way I'm going to go, that way you can listen to it just on your drive in to work or whatever, or, or you know, on your lunch break, uh, but then also, um, you know, if you're watching the movies, you can have something extra to have on your headphones while you're watching the film. So uh, without further ado, go ahead and get your DVD or Blu-ray ready, uh, or digital copy, whichever version you have, if you have a copy, and go ahead and hit play right now. And uh, I'll let you know when the, the logos start coming up. Yeah, here's the Screen Gems logo has started. Screen Gems. Awesome. Um... This movie originally, I mean, this has gone through so many different versions. For those who don't know, uh, there was a German company called Constantin Film or Constantine Film. I can't remember how you pronounce it. Davis Films, obviously, was just mentioned. Um, and Const uh, Constantine Films bought the film rights for Resident Evil way back in, like, right after the first game came out. Um, like, I want to say 97 or 98. And they went through multiple versions of the movie, like, in script format. And here we're hearing, uh, you know, the, the I think it's Jason Isaacs is doing the voiceover here. And uh, he's basically setting up the world of 
you know, Resident Evil, which is all focused around the Umbrella Corporation. They're a horrible group <laughs> uh, that that uh or they're not seen as horrible they have great pr people i guess and they make medicine and they do all these things they have military contracts and they seem to make the world a better place but obviously deep underneath that is not what they mainly use their money for uh they they create viral weapons and and monsters essentially and viruses um that could you know wipe out civilizations uh which is i guess their goal in these movies we're gonna we'll get through that as we get through the other movies you're gonna see how many contradictions there are and the worst part is is paul ws anderson wrote all six of these movies and it's almost like when he writes the next one he completely forgot what happened in the one before it because there are so many things that just contradict or don't overlap very well and it's it gets so bad so we're gonna have a good time with these uh, i am not a very positive person when it comes to these movies um i honestly i hate that the that there were six of these movies made because uh they are just uh, you know I don't know. I think they're terrible films, to be honest with you. And uh, and I know I'm mostly a positive guy on my channel, so I'm going to try to be informative here and, and talk about things that, you know, come across more informational as opposed to, you know, really ripping the movies apart. But occasionally I might not be able to help myself. Uh, one compliment I'll give is this scene right here with the viruses. Um, there's the blue is the virus and green is antivirus. And I think that's the green is in reference to the herbs from the games. So there's already references here from the games. And I think the filmmaker said they wanted to use, um, you know, like modern technology for when this movie came out in 2002, they wanted to use modern technology to, um, you know, here so he when he's using the the look like, hook arms and stuff like through the glass it's more modern it's not super high tech and i don't that was a conscious decision they made yet by the time you get to the you know fourth movie and stuff there's all kind of holograms there's even a hologram in this movie so it seems silly to do that kind of technology and then have the other technology that he was trying to avoid still used also um inconsistencies it just feels like it's like a bunch of kids who are just like wouldn't this be cool if we did this wouldn't this be cool if we did that without understanding what makes it cool and that's what these movies feel like it just feels like a, a hodgepodge of of things that someone who doesn't know what cool is doing things that they think are cool um, instead of actually trying to tell a story or develop real characters um, and it's not that I need like an Academy Award winning script from a Resident Evil movie. That's not what I'm looking for at all. But when you compare it to the stuff that inspired it, like the George Romero zombie movies, those movies had statements that they made about society, about people um, within the, you know, a zombie apocalypse. And this movie in a very uh, direct and stupid way tries to make those kind of references like, oh, look, evil corporation. But it it doesn't really know what what makes an evil corporation and it just everything just seems so all over the place so we'll, we'll get to that here um but i want to back up and you know talk about the earlier versions of the script and why they weren't made uh first there was alan b mcelroy who wrote um i think wrong turn i know him as the, the writer of spawn uh the movie spawn and i know he's not a very good writer and apparently he wrote a script for the movie and they passed on it because, you know, I don't know, they, they, they had a bunch of different reasons, but they, they passed on his script. Oh, uh, one of the reasons was that one of the producers uh, at Const uh, Constantine Films said something like, uh, oh, well, the second game came out, so making a, a movie based on the first game is now dated. And everybody loves the second game, so we don't want to make a movie based on the, the first game. Uh, that was like their reasoning. Plus his script, I don't think had anything to do with stars or umbrella. It had like a, a SWAT team was sent into the Arclay mountains to, um, you know, s investigate a, a house that could be potentially housing a cult of cannibals. So that's a little bit like the game. And then they were, they went missing. So the stars, or they're not the stars. They're like an, they're like a special forces team, um, that isn't called stars. They get sent in to, rescue the SWAT team um and then they find out that th the person owning the mansion is like a, a crazy person who has lured them here to do experiments or something like that um so yeah it just sounds like a, just a terrible movie but that's what I would expect from Alan B McElroy anyway um but then after he wasn't his script was rejected um in in 98 I think is when George Romero came on he was he directed the Resident Evil 2 Japanese commercials because Shinji Mikami the guy who created Resident Evil um, and one of the driving forces behind it and directed the first game 
he was a big fan of Romero and Romero inspired every, everything that he did in the games. So he said, you know, let's get this guy in here. Let's get him to direct the, the Japanese commercials for the second game. And that went over so well, apparently, and it made an impact with C- Constantine films and, and Sony that they were like, all right, we'll give this guy a chance and we'll let him, you know, we'll, uh, we'll let him make the movie. Um, so, uh, our, so, you know, he gets, he gets hired and, and, uh, put on as writer and director of Resident Evil. And so it was like, Hey, cool. George Romero, the guy who essentially made zombie movies a thing again and reinvented them. He is now getting a chance to do, you know, Resident Evil, which is, which is super awesome. So I was uh, really excited when they first announced that and then nothing, like nothing happened of that at all. Um, and it was a bummer. And the main reason is because they said his script was borderline NC-17. He had he had the Stars team in it. He had Umbrella. He had the Mansion. He had Wesker and Ada. I think Ada was in it. Um, and he had all these other characters in the games that were in it. And they ended up just scrapping it uh, because the studio was like, no, it's almost NC-17. So we can't make this movie. And I think Chris and Jill were like, boyfriend and girlfriend in the movie so I don't think Chris he wasn't like a stars member he was like a falconeer or something um and it was yeah it's just it was a little bit of a different take but at least it had all the characters there um and it told a, a fairly cohesive story but then they scrapped it and this you know they were like no we're not going to hire Romero he's and then one guy some producer at uh Capcom was like yeah his script sucked I hated it or something like that so so I guess there was no love loss there um seemed like a bad breakup uh so then you know we, it went through a couple other people like Jamie Blanks and a few other people that came on in the late 90s early 2000s before it landed in Paul W.S. Anderson's lap and he was the guy who made Mortal Kombat so he had kind of made the only successful video game movie and so I think for that reason, Sony was interested in him, and so was Constantine Film. They were interested for that reason. Um, and here I'll pause for a second. Look at the floor right there. If you're watching this, it's bending. The metal is bending, and it's because obviously it was a safety floor. You know, because you gotta you know keep that safety in mind when you're filming scenes like this. You don't want her to get really hurt. So um, yeah. Anyway, that that's something they pointed out in the director commentary, and I was like, oh, that's neat. I didn't even notice that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, and this uh, the scene here with Alice's eye opening, that's a reference to the first video game. I think it opens on a shot where like it zooms in on like Chris's eye or something and it's like and then you hear him go, Ah and then blood splatters and so yeah, Paul Anderson was definitely did a lot of that in this movie. There's a lot of doors opening in this movie, there's a lot of things like that that he feels are cool references to the game. Like, oh, isn't it cool? There's so many doors that open in the game, so let's make a bunch of doors open in this movie. But because they only had the budget for, like, two doors, <laughs> they they shot the same type of door opening over and over and over, like, 12 different ways. Um, so, yeah, the m- magic of filmmaking. So I think that's ultimately why Paul Anderson was picked. Like, he he wrote a script that wasn't really tied to the games. I mean, he, he claimed that it was a prequel to the first game, and he's like, oh, this is how the outbreak at the mansion occurred. But it's like, well, no, it's not, because Resident Evil Zero was already planned around this time and came out, um, you know, like a year later from this game or from this movie. And so, uh, and I think Paul even said while they were filming this movie, they were showing him stuff from Resident Evil Zero. I don't know if that's true or not, or if he actually said that or someone else did. But, um, but even even still, Resident Evil Zero was in development, and Resident Evil Zero kind of explains what happened at the mansion in the games. So, so his attempt to basically lie, <laughs> I guess he was like, you know, oh no, this is a prequel. And his, his idea was he wanted to make a prequel to the first game, a game set during Resident Evil 2, or I'm sorry, a, a, a movie, you know, prequel to the first game, and then a movie set during the events of Resident Evil 2 and 3, the games. And then he wanted to make a third movie in the trilogy to take place like years later. And that was his original plan. And uh, I kind of wish he stuck with it. <laughs> so that way we would only have three bad Resident Evil movies. Um, but he kept going. And as much as I love Mila and as, lo- as much as I love like Ali Larder and, and uh, Michelle Rodriguez and all these people that were in these movies, uh, Eric Mabius, who's in this movie, as much as I love all of them, uh, I, man, do I hate these movies. Like they're, they're not even a guilty pleasure. Like I'd rather watch a Transformer movie um, because at least in that, like Peter Cullen is still doing the voice of Optimus and, it, and he sounds like Optimus and he does things that are kind of Optimus E, um, you know, Optimus Prime like, so it, it has more 
connection tissue to the source material than this does. Um, that gun, by the way, for people who are gun fanatics, it's an MP5, uh, which is a really cool looking weapon. Um, but, uh, but all these shots, like it, you know, th they shot this movie. Oh, anyway, so that was, I think that's why Paul Anderson was, was hired was cause he's a guy who can, he was successful with Mortal Kombat. Every other video game movie that's been made since has, has bombed big time. Um, so that was in his favor and he's pretty good about coming in around or under budget. And, uh, he's also doesn't stir the pot. Like if, if someone has a reference or if they have an idea, he'll, he'll kind of listen to it. He's kind of easy to work with from what I understand. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm sure he has his bad days too, but I don't hear a lot of bad stories about the guy. So, and obviously Mila fell in love with him because the two of them have been married for years. I, you know, I think after making this movie together, um, they just, you know, fell in love and, you know, had to started a family and everything. So, um, and then by the end, the movies kind of just became like, a fun family project for them to do uh, from you know you know movies four five and six um, and even to the point where in the sixth film I think their daughters in it as the the new Red Queen so it kind of became a family affair and since they've made a lot of money for Sony they were allowed to keep doing it so I don't you know I understand the business reason for why more movies came and stuff but I just feel like quality wise like I'm like man there's a couple shots in each movie that are pretty good there's a couple moments from the actors in each movie that are pretty good um, but really the writing is, is awful all across the board through all six movies. Um, and, uh, and I, I think it takes all the, the elements from the video game that I don't like and kind of puts a magnifying glass onto it and, and expands that. And that's a bummer because there's so many great things in the video games that, uh, these movies do not capture in my opinion. Um, those crows there were CGI, <laughs> they, the, but they wanted to put crows in for a scene because the video game has crows, so they did that. Um, this is supposed to be the wind kicking up because a helicopter is landing, although we don't hear it and she doesn't see it until right now where the, when the lights go by. Um, but again, for budget reasons, they had to not show the helicopter. Um, so I don't know, it's creative, it's effective, it works. Um, and like I said, there's a couple things in this that aren't bad. Like the, the scene here is, is not too bad. Um, and uh, I like their costumes. They're kind of based off of the hunk design. So that was the one thing Paul Anderson, he did. Um, and he, he's like so proud of it too. Like he was like, oh, I, I, I took a bunch of footage from the video games and like, like full playthroughs. Like he had someone record their playthroughs of the video games and then show it to people on sets like you know set designers and sound designers and so the and actors so they can understand the world of resident evil but george romero did that before he did like when george romero got the job he had his assistant um i think or his secretary play the entire game over like a weekend and record herself doing it and then give him the footage so that he could, because he, you know, George Romero is like, I'm not going to play a video game. He was like, you know, 60, 70 or 80 years old or whatever at that point, 60 years old. So he was like, yeah, I'm not going to play this video game. So uh, he had his secretary do it. And and then he watched that footage to understand who the characters were, what the world was. And it's so funny that Paul Anderson actually played Resident Evil. And George Romero just watched a video of someone playing it. And yet George Romero, to me wrote a better script, um, than Paul Anderson did. Um, but, uh, and it's funny too, cause they said Paul, you know, they said Romero didn't get his movie made because it was NC 17 or it could have been, but, uh, but it, you know, it's not, it's, uh, this movie actually had an NC 17 rating at one point and they had to cut stuff out to make it rated R. So, um, so that was clearly a BS reason to not go with Romero's, um, I'm going to guess he was, you know, he might've been hard to work with. I'm, I don't know for sure, but, um, but, uh, Paul Anderson, like I said, I think he's pretty laid back dude. And it was like, yeah. And he, and he wanted to do it. I mean, I can't fault the guy. He really wanted to make a resident evil movie. Like there's not that many people in Hollywood that are like, dude, resident evil. I want to make it, you know, like, so that's at least it went to someone who, you know, considers himself a fan. Uh, that's for sure. He's not, I don't think he, is the type of fan that I want making the movies after seeing six of his versions, but, um, but still he's a fan. So I'm not, I can't take that away from him. And that's, that's, I'd rather a fan at least try to make these movies than a non fan. Um, on the front of the train there, it said Alexi 5,000. I think that's a reference to Alexia Ashford from the code Veronica video game. 
And this train car that they're all coming into right now where they're pushing Matt out of the way, um, Matt Addison, played by Eric Mabius, who I'm a huge fan of, um, this train car is based off the one from the second video game. And this is Michelle Rodriguez climbing under the train. Her name's uh, Rain Ancampo. Ancampo. She, on the commentary track, points out some interesting things about um, the film and how originally there was all these Alice in Wonderland references. And that's why the character Alice is named Alice. And that's why the, the computer villain is called the Red Queen. Um, it was something I didn't notice right off the bat. It wasn't like blaring at first until um, I thought about it more. And I was like, oh, wait, those are Alice in Wonderland references. And then I saw this movie with the commentary track where she explains that. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, I got gotcha. you. Um, this sound here that you, Michelle Rodriguez is shining the light through the hole in the, and like the fence down there, you hear, uh, that's actually the sound department did like, they recorded like, uh, a couple hundred roaches crawling. And that's the sound you hear is roaches. Um, because that's also a reference to Resident Evil 2. Some people thought that was like the dogs walking around in there. Um, but it's actually roaches. Uh, anyway, so. Yeah, so Paul Anderson, he came onto this movie, and, and this opening that we've seen so far, it's it's not bad. I mean, I feel like Mila, like having a character with amnesia is stupid. I hate that trope, and the, the worst thing about that is you can't really make a character out of someone who has no memory, um, unless you do something like 50 First Dates, where it's like a struggle, and, and, you know, and, her, and you see the effect that her memory lapses have on her loved ones and her family and, and her trying to have a dating life, and it's like, you know not to give that movie too much credit, but I do think that movie's actually a pretty good movie when dealing with this kind of trope or, you know, that kind of issue. And they make the whole movie based around that. Whereas this one doesn't. They just conveniently give two characters um, amnesia just because. And they say, oh, amnesia could be a side effect of the virus. I mean, of the of the gas that get, the nerve gas that went into the house. And it's like, well, if it could be, then what are the odds that both this guy, James, played by James Purefoy, his character's name is Spence, which is a reference to uh, Oswald E. Spencer from the video games. Um, and then Mila's character, Alice, like what are the odds that both of them would get amnesia? Uh, the odds are very uh, slim to none, actually. Um, so not that, I, again, you know, it's Resident Evil. You're not supposed to really dive too deep into stuff. But as a fan, it's it's kind of hard for me not to because I actually really do like the lore of these games. There's interesting stuff in this universe, like genuinely interesting stuff. Um, like for me, if someone was like, hey, what would you do with a Resident Evil movie? I'd probably start off in the 60s when, you know, Oswell E. Spencer and Ashford and Marcus um, all found the flower in Africa and decided to, you know, derive from it the progenitor virus. And you kind of start there and then flash forward to modern day. You show people living in Raccoon City and life is good, and, you know, and, and uh, medicine, you know, they're like, they, they got like cheap medicine from, from Umbrella and, you know, Umbrella has their hands and everything. You like, you see their logo everywhere and, and, uh, and people don't even bat an eyelash at it. Um, they're, you know, they're blissfully ignorant because Umbrella, the amount of good things Umbrella provides and you kind of set that up and you set up what this world is like, um, with, you know, with that happening and, uh, with, with a company that can control your whole town. Um, I thought that would have been a, you know, that's more of an interesting way to open something and, uh, and then dive into the horror element of it by showing the contrast of the, the good life first, like the, the, the foreshadowing of doom with the flower. But even that you're like, Oh, it's a flower. But yet that flower brings so much death. <laughs> it's this beautiful flower in Africa. And from it, you get, you know, tyrant monsters and, and a nemesis and all these things in a, in a roundabout way, you know, with missing with the progenitor virus, of course. But, um, but it's the foundation of, of all these horrible things. And I just think those are more interesting themes than the, the non themes that this movie tries to talk about. Um, and the scene here where they're in this big warehouse, uh, train facility where the train pulls in, that's actually a real place. The U-Bahn, which is, uh, was being rebuilt in Germany at this time. It was an underground railroad system or, you know, train system. Um, it was being rebuilt at this time. So they allowed, the production for Resident Evil to film a bunch of stuff down here for like little to no money. I think another movie called Equilibrium with uh, Christian Bale also filmed in Germany in these tunnels around the same time. Um, I think maybe after this movie came out. I can't remember. Um, and then this is also a reference to the games. You have maps. You know, in the games you have paper maps. 
And again, if you're going to show old tech or more modern technology, like the claws through the glass, like, you know, tampering with the virus in the beginning of the movie, then show a paper map, <laughs> but they go right into now that, now that they got the, the low tech opening out of the way, they're like, all right, now everything else is going to be high tech. And it's like, well, make up your mind. <laughs> like, um, cause as nice as this is, you know, someone who's out in the field, I don't care how rich, you know, umbrella is, they're not going to have this, but then this is just one of the many problems as far as that kind of stuff goes, because umbrella seems to, once you get to the sixth movie, you, you're just like, what was even umbrella's purpose? Like, did, like they're so inconsistent and the, the stuff they spend money on, it's like really holographic maps like that on a wristwatch, um, cloning, like these are all things you can make 10 times the amount of money off of more so than just developing a new virus that will kill people or turn them into zombies. Like the, out of everything they develop, that seems to be like something that's the least profitable <laughs> actually. Um, cause, uh, yeah, there's just so many other gases and things that are already out there that you can use to wipe out a civilization. Um, but turning everyone into mindless zombies. And then when you get to the sixth film and they explain their plan, you're just like, you're like, whatever, like they, they, uh, uh a, a, a company controlled apocalypse is what they were trying to do. And we'll talk about that when we get to the sixth film, because I don't want to jump too far ahead. I don't want to, I don't want to reveal how, just how stupid the series is before we get there. Um, we'll take our time with it. Uh, but these scenes here, uh, Colin Salmon, he's the, the big African American gentleman to the left there, back there. Um, he plays a character named one. Um, there's also a guy named JD on the team. That's this guy here. Uh, he's kind of based on Tweedle Dumb, I think Michelle Rodriguez said in the commentary track. And Michelle Rodriguez's character is named Rain, and she was based on uh, Tweedle D. Um, Matt Addison, played by Eric Mabius, he's the the guy in the blue shirt back there next to Mila. Um, he uh, he, I guess he was the caterpillar, the smoking caterpillar. <laughs> in one scene coming up, you'll see. I'll, I'll reference it. Um, that lady there with the gun, her name is literally, that's, I'm sorry, that, that was Michelle Rodriguez. This lady here, um, her name is Medic. She's literally called Medic. She doesn't have a code name or nothing. She just, Medic is her code name. Um, and all the scientists that were down here, they're like Dr. Blue, Dr. Black, Dr. Red, Dr. Brown, you know, they have all that. Like none of them have like real identities or names, um, because I guess they're okay with living and working like that for Umbrella and still think umbrella is doing well because they even make a reference like oh some of the employees down here might not have known some of the experiments that were being done and it's yeah, i don't know it's, it's like you're going to trap all these people underground and force them to live down there with no sunlight or nothing <laughs> and and uh you're gonna ex i don't know it just it seems so backwards and then you find out in the sixth movie they wanted the virus to get out but the way the virus gets out in this is something they kind of couldn't have planned for and then you think, okay, well, maybe they could have planned for it by, by baiting the person who actually leaks the virus. Like maybe they're like, oh, hey, maybe they pretend to be someone on the black market and they're like, hey, we'll buy the virus if you can steal it for us. Maybe they did that to bait him to release the virus. Um, but they, but then you, then the red queen like did all of this. They locked all the employees in their rooms and their offices because the virus could have got out and that's part of her safety protocol. But then in the sixth movie, you find out they have complete control over the Red Queen. So they could have just made her release the virus. <laughs> like, it's, so it's so stupid. This, this franchise is so stupid. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, there's, there's some of the background, the, the versions of the movie that could have been. Um, and then now we're in the scene here in the hallway where, you know, everyone's asking what's happening, what's going on. And Colin Salmon here is, is given the answers. He's like, uh, yeah, a couple hours ago, the red queen went homicidal and locked everyone in here with the virus and released it. And, and that's why we're here. So they don't even know why they're here. The umbrella lied to them. Um, <laughs> and you're like, wow, they're so expendable. Like umbrella literally doesn't care about them. But then you find out in like three movies from now that they're all clones anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> so it doesn't matter and uh and some guy that um Mila randomly meets uh Carlos in the second movie he he does work for Umbrella but he's he's like a mercenary that that works for Umbrella but apparently he's a clone too and or he's the original and there and there's other clones I don't know it's so stupid I think it's in the commentary it's funny in this movie Mila says I really want to work with Colin and Michelle again because you know spoiler alert they both die in this movie um 
So she's like, I really want to work with them again. Can you bring them back as clones? And she literally asks that in the commentary of this. And I thought that was so funny because in a couple movies, that's exactly what happens. Um, they just are like, oh, we'll just, we'll just clone them and bring them back. But again, you're like, Umbrella can make clones? Then why are they making viruses? <laughs> oh, man, this movie's so stupid. Um, this franchise is so dumb. And uh, I think in one movie they say, oh, the, the plants and rivers and oceans dried up because of the T-virus. But then in the very next movie, there's the oceans are are there and there's glaciers and there's and there's plant life everywhere and you're just like wait what but the last movie said uh and like i said they're all written by one guy paul ws anderson so you know is paul anderson a a bad filmmaker no uh, by stand by the standards of filmmaking he's on time he shows up to work he's professional he's I, from what I understand, easy to work with. Uh, he comes in around or under budget um, for pretty much every movie he makes, and he's reasonable. Like if you if you tell him to change something or do something different, he's pretty reasonable from what I understand. So on that regard, and he you know he, the Resident Evil movies have made profits each one. I think a total of all the budgets for all six movies is around two hundred and eighty million dollars to for make to make all six movies, and that's that's not bad considering like one. Marvel movie is made for, you know, that almost, <laughs> you know, or uh, Dr. Doolittle, which just came out with, uh, with Robert Downey Jr. was like a $175 million budget for a Dr. Doolittle movie. And you could have made five Resident Evil movies with that amount of money, um, or four of them. Um, so in that regard, it's good. And then total, the movies made over like $1.2 billion or $1.3 billion total between all six movies. So yeah, they're profitable. They do, they, they make a lot of money. Um, and they don't cost a lot to make. So, um, and this scene here, I like this scene where they come into the quote unquote dining hall and that's what the map said, but then they come in and it's all these pods. And then you have Eric Mabius who plays Matt Addison, who you're not really sure what his motives are. He says he's a cop and he's, and he's looking for like his sister. You find out he actually is looking for a sister. She works for this company, for the Umbrella Corporation, in this hive laboratory. And uh, Mila and her knew each other, um, basically. And you're going to find that out later. But he's like, he works for some organization that is trying to take down Umbrella. And uh, and he's like a very active member. But he even he couldn't get the clearance it would take to get into this facility. So his sister was brought on board. So he feels responsible, you know, that she's... Um, that she's here and I'm like yeah that's that's actually good that's a character <laughs> and that's a motivation and that's everything like why wasn't Matt Addison the main character of this story because Mila you have no idea what her motivations are you have no idea what makes her tick what what side of the fence she falls on on certain issues or um, when things arise why she makes certain decisions because she's an amnesiac right when you start the movie and you have no idea who she is and unfortunately as much as I love Mila and she's a good actress and other stuff um she's just a blank slate here. You can't really tell what she's supposed to be feeling until towards, I mean, she looks a little confused, um, at times, <laughs> but that's it. And so how are you supposed to root for that character? But yet there's so many fans of her character, Alice, but she's just like, she's too perfect. Like when, when they need her to like be a Kung Fu master, she's a Kung Fu master. When they needed her to be the best shot in the room, she's the best shot in the room. She's, she's so powerful that other characters don't even bother doing anything. They'll see a zombie and they'll throw her a gun and say, here, you shoot the zombie. And then she does. It's like every single time, like she, she, she kills every major monster and creation that the umbrella corporation makes. And hardly anyone else ever gets a moment to shine because they're all just expendable, dumb characters that are given names from characters from the, the video games but no motivation and they're not actual interpretations of them. They're just like, oh, here, let's get this good looking Swedish guy with long hair and we'll call him Leon. Okay, what does he do that makes him Leon? Uh, nothing, but we'll give him one scene where he like touches Ada's thigh because Leon likes Ada. And it's, it's so stupid. God, it's so stupid. This franchise makes me sick to my stomach. Um, so, but the scene here is is uh, this is her going through the looking glass again another Alice in Wonderland reference uh, Paul Anderson cannot seem to make a movie with any real original ideas everything in this movie is a reference to something else I mean granted he's basing it off a video game so it's one thing to reference the video game because you're like alright we gotta bring the video game to life 
But then he just referenced it. Like every scene in this movie that you may be a fan of, he took from something else. He took from Alien. He took from Cube. Uh, this scene right here is from a, a great indie horror film that came out on the Sci-Fi Channel, I think in the late 90s, um, called Cube, uh, C-U-B-E. And in that movie, it's a bunch of people who are trapped in these cubes and they're trying to go room to room to, uh, you know, to find the exit of these cubes. So it's just like a, like, you know, a couple hundred cubes or a couple thousand or 10,000. I can't remember how many, uh, cubed rooms and some of the rooms are booby trapped. So they meet this guy called the Wren right at the beginning of the movie. And I'm going to spoil a little bit of cube here because uh, for the reference sake. Um, so go watch cube, please. But they meet a guy named the Wren, and he's like a French escape artist. And uh, he finds out the rooms are booby trapped, and he's throwing his boots into each room to see if it's sound related or whatever um, that activates the trap. And uh, one of the rooms he miscalculates, and he, because and, you're like, oh, this is the guy who's going to get everybody out. He's the one who has all the answers, and he can solve things. And he figured out the rooms are booby trapped, so he's going to get everyone out. And then he dies. And that's exactly what they do here with Colin Salmon's character. One, they bring him and these agents into this hallway and they're like, all right, we're going to bring him in. He's no nonsense guy. He's the leader. He's a, uh, he's definitely, you know, commands respect. You know, when he shows up, he's very stoic and, and to the point. And you're like, oh wow, this guy's a definite leader. And then they kill him in the scene. So even just that kind of character just exists to be a reference to the movie cube. Um, and none of these characters are characters. Like none of them have any real motivations or reasons for anything they do except Matt Addison. Uh, and, and this isn't me just trying to butter up Eric Mabius cause I'm a big fan. Um, I met Eric Mabius in 2000, I think 2000. He, um, I went to a screening at Dragon Con in Atlanta for the crow salvation. And he played the crow in the third movie. And, uh, I met him and he was super nice and just the greatest guy. He sat and talked to me for a few minutes and I was like, anytime this guy's in a movie, I'm going to go see it. So when I saw that they're making a Resident Evil movie, one, I was already excited. I was like, great. I love Resident Evil. Uh, okay, good. It's by the guy who did Mortal Kombat. Let's see. And he did also Paul Anderson or Paul W.S. Anderson also made Event Horizon, which is kind of a, a neat guilty pleasure film. Um, if you like sci-fi horror, um, Oh, by the way, this death right here, him getting cut into little cubes, that is literally the opening scene of Cube, the movie. So, again, just like this whole room, just no original ideas. And then so unoriginal that he brings this laser room back, I think, three more times over the course of the next five movies. I think two or three more movies after this have the laser room in it. <laughs> like, uh, he's like, remember the laser room? It's like, yes, we remember the fucking laser room Paul W.S. Anderson um stop referencing it and then I think they even put the laser room in Resident Evil 4 the video game or one of the Resident Evil games has a laser room in it because of the movie it's like ugh make me gag man um so uh so yeah anyway so I met I met Eric Mabius and he he was super cool just a, just the nicest guy in the world and uh and I was so excited he was in this movie. And then when I saw this movie, I was like, wow, he's the only character with any motivation or, or any interest. Like they kind of took his motivation from Claire Redfield a little bit. He's, he's here looking for a sibling. That was Claire's whole thing in Resident Evil 2 was she came to town to look for Chris Redfield, um, who may or may not have been taken by the Umbrella Corporation. So Matt Addison is coming in to, you know, look for a sister who may or may not you know, be down here working for the Umbrella Corporation still. Um, she may have got out, she may not have, but he's trying to find confirmation of that. And so because of that, you know, he, he is a character. He's like an actual character with a motivation. Um, and then he actually has, I wouldn't say he has an arc, um, but he has a tragic ending. Um, at the end of this movie, and one of the reasons why I want to do a commentary on this so close to the third remake coming out is because we don't know in the video game universe who Nemesis is. Um, a lot of people were, I think, surprised that he was human at one point because I saw all the reactions when Nemesis, when the remake leak image came out and they showed like a nose on his face and his stretched skin and people were like, wait, Nemesis was a human? Like, he was an experiment? It's like, yeah, he was an experiment. So was the tyrants. Uh, so are the liquors. Like, 
those are experiments. Those are hu mutated human beings <laughs> that are, uh, I think the, the liquors are a product of something called the V Act, which is something that makes the Crimson Head Zombies in the remake of the first game. And they're like an evolved version of that, you know, the liquors are. Um, so, uh, so same with tyrants. Like, I think there's something like one in a million people have the genetic makeup to sustain and fight the virus long enough to mutate into something like a tyrant. So that's why tyrants are very rare. Um, I think Mr. X's are a form of tyrant. They're not as, I guess, lethal or direct as the, the original tyrant, um, but they can be programmed. Uh, so where they lack like deducing and deduction skills, they can be just directly programmed to do simple things. So like Mr. X in the original Resident Evil 2, he was assigned to get a sample of the G-Virus. So the reason why he was after Sherry Birkin and, uh, you know, Annette and everybody was because he went after people who had a sample of the G-Virus on them, um, or Ada, you know, at one point. So, and even Leon and Claire by the end of the game. So, uh, so that there was like a purpose. In the new Resident Evil 2 remake, you have no idea why the Mr. X is, is around. Like, you have no, no clue. He just shows up and punches Leon and Claire for no reason. And you just to be a scary monster, and you have no freaking idea. Um, that's one of my negative critiques, I would say, of the the second video game, the remake. Um, so I'm hoping the third video game doesn't do that. Uh, but so far, them showing Nemesis having human features is neat because it showed all these people who, you know, were like, "Oh, I'm a hardcore Resident Evil fan," and they're like, "Wait, Nemesis was a human?" It's like, yeah, he was. Uh, the, in the first remake, they added a character called Lisa Trevor. Um, and she was the daughter of the guy who designed the mansion, uh, you know, uh, the, the Trevor family. She was the daughter of that family and, uh, she got injected, her and her mother did. And, uh, George Trevor, her father was the one who built the mansion and got locked in it and then ended up dying. Um, but her mother, the virus killed her mother, but she was able to adapt with the virus. She still turned into a monster, but she was able to adapt. And, uh, and from her, there was like a parasite that they injected her with that, was the parasite would that would be the basis for nemesis and they injected the parasite into her and it didn't kill her and when they extracted the parasite they were then from that able to make you know nemesis i guess or perfect nemesis so nemesis is like one in a billion um so there's only one nemesis mr x is there's a whole island of them called sheena island run by a guy named vincent in a game called resident evil survivor and uh, he was able to make a bunch of duplicate versions of Mr. X's, and that's where the Mr. X's came from that got sent into Raccoon City, as we find out in Survivor. And I'll just interrupt myself for a second here and just say that last moment there, we saw Matt Addison sitting up on the on the wall. That, again, was, like I said earlier, the reference to him being the caterpillar from uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, but one thing you'll notice in the background, see all those, uh, car those I guess, those chambers in the far background there? If you look really closely, you'll notice they look a little different than the other ones. Uh, it's because of the budget of this movie. They could only make about five or six of those chambers. And all the ones in the background there, the far background, are all cardboard. Um, and that speaks to, you know, I you know, to give the movie credit. Because you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, not here just to re I'm not here to review the movie. I'm just here to talk over it and point out things and reference the shows or the, you know, the, the games and, and anything else that I can that's Resident Evil related. Um, but I will comment on the movie and I'll give them some credit. Like to make this feel big, you know, they... They built a bunch of cardboard uh, backgrounds, and I think one of the producers was like, you can't do that. And they were like, well, we're going to try, and they pull it off. Like, again, if you're watching on Blu-ray or high def and you pause it, you can see in the background they're, they're clearly two-dimensional, <laughs> uh, but uh, mainly your eye is going to be focused on the actor. So if the actor is moving fast enough or walking or it's a close-up, you're not going to really notice. So, you know, again, that's where I think Paul Anderson is good at his job is he's good at the is pulling a team together that can make stuff like that um, a reality and it still sell the idea like okay they're in a room full of these chambers but they're not the room that we're seeing here is not as big as we think it is and there's definitely not nearly as many chambers as we think there are um, and that's good filmmaking so uh, so again if I'm gonna give him some credit I mean I'll give him that at least uh, he knows what he's doing when it comes to that kind of stuff and so does his team and he puts together a really good team on a lot of his movies um, because some of his movies don't look bad but uh, man I wish he was not the writer of his movies I wish someone else was especially with Resident Evil because 
I, these movies are so hollow and empty and it's a bummer because the games I don't feel are, uh, and, uh, it's, you know, and I don't care. Like, I think these movies got really bad reviews from critics and stuff. And I'm like, I don't care what critics think of them. Um, I care about what fans think of stuff like this and I'm interested to hear other people's opinions. And I know there are people that do like these movies and, and, you know, so, you know big fans of Alice out there. There's a lot of fans. Like when these movies were coming out, there were so many fans of Alice. I think I went and saw at, um, one of the, I think it was WonderCon back when it was in San, uh, it was in San Francisco. They used to have WonderCon up there and I would go not every year, but a couple of years I went before I got really sick and um, Mila was there and Ali Larder was there at one of them. And they, they went and, you know, made kind of a splash at those conventions because one, they were smaller conventions. They weren't like as big as San Diego, uh, but they were run by the same people that do San Diego. And uh, they would go there and, and man, Mila and she would get like a standing ovation. And, you know, a lot of people love her from Fifth Element, which I do, too. And I've seen her in a lot of movies since then. And she's a good actress, but but in these movies I'm, I just don't like the character she's so she's such a blank slate and literally whenever the script needs okay we, they're in a tough situation we need someone to be awesome at fighting and then it's like okay Mill is going to do it and you know or Alice is going to do it and then um, alright we need someone who can there's three bullets left we need someone who can hit their target with all three bullets and make it look cool okay well, we're going to have Alice do it and, and uh, alright there's a scene where this person's trapped well, they're not going to get themselves out of that area. They're going to they're gonna call for Alice to show up, and Alice will come save them because no one else in this franchise can wipe their own butt unless Alice is around to hand them toilet paper. Um, and that's how this franchise treats other characters. And unfortunately, those are characters that I love from the games, like Chris and, and Claire and uh, Leon and Ada. Those are fan-favorite characters, and they are reduced to just mindless, stupid background noise um in these movies that they just can't do anything for themselves barry burton like all of them they're all fan favorite characters and they get no love and if you someone if you told someone who only seen these movies like oh you know barry burton's my favorite resident evil character and then they watch resident evil 5 retribution <laughs> they're gonna go barry like you mean that guy in the background that dies <laughs> like you're like that he's your favorite why you know and you're like no in the game you know like in the game like, here's how interesting Barry is in the game. In the video game of Resident Evil 1, Barry is best friends with Jill and Chris. He's best friends with Chris, uh, but he knows Jill and he's friends with Jill because they talk over, like, weapons and guns, and they get their guns made at a, a gun shop called Kendo's Gun Shop, which is in the second remake game and also might be in the third one coming up. Um, at least a lot of people are speculating that. And uh, because she leaves him like a note that they added in. Anyway, that's that's a lot of video game stuff that I'm talking about there. Uh, but in the video game, uh, the team, the stars team, gets sent into the mansion because there's potential cannibals in the woods. There's all these unexplained deaths of these people getting eaten, like joggers and hikers and even kids. They were like, oh, there's kids missing. So the the it's happening in a small town called Raccoon City, and and they're not used to this kind of stuff. And they're like, it's a small, quiet town that's still growing, you know, but maybe like the size of like Greenville to South Carolina, which is where I'm from. It, it, it grew, you know, pretty much, uh, pre pretty big for like a small town, uh, you know, originally. And, um, and so I always kind of saw Raccoon City as something like that, like as a place that had farms and, and, you know, mountains, not that Greenville does, but, you know, just, it has like, these different uh, landscapes there and uh and they're quiet and quaint and and they you know they all work like in greenville there's a bmw plant nearby and a lot of people work for the bmw plant and that's kind of how i saw umbrella like all right umbrella has a facility and half the town works for that facility or like i'm from Wirton, west virginia where there used to be a steel mill uh steel mill before they closed it down and my grandfather worked there and half the town worked at that steel mill so uh i always think of umbrella having that kind of hold over a small town like if you took um, umbrella's facility away you would take out most of the jobs and it would destroy that economy of that town much like the steel mill did when it was taken away from weirton it destroyed that town's economy so you know you, you try to apply these real world things so in the video game this small town is now dealing with potential cannibals and uh and a cult or something and so they go you know what um, we have a special response team that we've funded uh, of trained soldiers, you know, because our cops aren't able to find anything, like no no detectives have been able to cro uh, crack the case. So let's send in this special forces team called the STARS team. And uh, and they send them in, 
and that star team stars team gets wiped out by zombies and stuff um and and so in the game though barry burton is a member of that stars team and he has a wife and two daughters at home and the villain of the story albert wesker uh, the team leader he blackmails barry into betraying the team by threatening to hurt his family and barry has to make a decision throughout the game you know like is he gonna continue to betray his team or is he going to do the right thing which may put his family in danger and it's it, that's interesting i mean that's at least a character <laughs> that's more than this movie has um and that's what's so frustrating is like wow there's real motivation and, and stuff between the characters in the games and uh in this movie just it <laughs> has none of that like none of it at all because once we once matt right here you see him walking behind mila and those cardboard cutouts in the back um once and we just saw the liquor escape too, which is a monster from the second game, um, and uh, which is still cool. The movie did a good job with the liquor. I think they said something like it took a couple thousand man hours to animate like seven seconds of that liquor. So yeah, a lot of hard work went into them, and it looks good. I don't, I don't care if I know there's going to be arguments of like the liquor shouldn't have been in this movie. They should have done a tyrant. They should have done other things. I agree on a lot of levels, but I will say the liquor looks awesome in this movie. And some of the shots they do are just lifted right out of the video game. So, you know, can't, can't really complain too much there. Um, but, uh, but you know, this, the Matt, like once he finds his sister, which is a scene coming up, you get a little bit of emotion there and you see him upset that his sister is gone. He feels responsible. And then after that, nothing, he's a, he's a blank slate for the rest of the movie. And Mila, pretty much does everything uh, like anyone he, like Matt tries to do a few things but he's unsuccessful at it everybody who tries to do something they're unsuccessful at it uh, only Mila from from the halfway point of this movie onward is the only one who's effective in any way to do anything and it's uh it's it's so infuriating I think Matt does get a moment where he kills Michelle Rodriguez at the end and then she lands on the button so there's at least something there for that character but and that's it um, but he doesn't, uh, and sorry, I'm, I just kicked something <laughs> just now. Sorry. Um, I'm shifting in my chair. They, uh, this movie's just, I don't know, like it, they have characters in it, but they don't do anything with them. You don't really feel for any of them when they die. You're just like, well, I like Michelle Rodriguez. I don't want Michelle Rodriguez to die, but she's not playing Michelle Rodriguez. She should be playing a character and, uh, and the character is, you know, not I don't know it's kind of generic a lot of these characters are and that's I don't mean to like sound so mean and poke at these tremendous actors and people that work on these movies but like I take these movies like the like you know they say oh Paul Anderson he was like the guy in Hollywood who wanted to make this movie like yeah I, I write too and man it would be a dream job to write Resident Evil uh, but I also know that when you write a movie, you have to deal with stupid producers and executives. Um, and that's why these movies come out bad sometimes is because some of those executives will be like, you know, they'll look at your script and go, nah, if we do this, it, it's going to be too expensive or it's going to be NC 17 or whatever. And you go, okay, well I'll, I'll make some changes. They're like, no, you're fired. Uh, we need someone who understands the material and you're just going to be like, <laughs> you know, and so, th so there have probably been people who are talented, who could have made a good Resident Evil movie probably tried and uh, I think there's even one kind of in development now and the guy who's writing the new upcoming um oh is it Mortal Kombat I think he's writing his name last name's Russo I think I follow him on Twitter he seems like a nice guy um I don't know too much about his work but he wrote a Resident Evil script and then he also wrote he's also the writer of the new Mortal Kombat movie so I imagine if the new Mortal Kombat movie is a big hit they'll probably dig his script out over at Sony and make his Resident Evil movie. Because I think right now it's on, on hold. They can't find a director or whatever. Um, and they keep saying, oh, it's a, it's a horror script. It's going to go back to the roots of Resident Evil. But I don't know. I, I don't believe that. And I know they're going to still make a movie out of it. And I've seen Sony make horror movies. And they're all these dumb jump scare type <laughs> movies. Like, I just, I don't know if I have a lot of faith in, in that. Um, I try to be optimistic. But um, after six of these movies uh, I you know you're gonna see when I get to the commentary like right now I'm kind of holding back and 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 trying to be you know professional <laughs> I guess in a way and, and nice but that's that veil is gonna break by the time we get to the sixth movie uh, big time um, but like I said each movie has at least some positive so I'll mention them but these aren't reviews these are just me talking about Resident Evil talking about the franchise um, 
and talking about, uh, you know, just different things, Re Resident Evil related, that uh, might connect to what we're seeing on screen. And so this scene here, Mila, the dogs are, you know, she's fighting the dog. She j runs up the wall now and she's kicking the dog in the face and <laughs> it goes through the window. Um, I think she said she trained for like months to be able to perform that. And I think she performed most of the scenes, her stunts, mo like 95% of the stunts in this movie, I think, were performed by her, which is great. I mean, that's, that's very awesome of her. Not that she does... I'm not going to say she doesn't do hard stuff in this movie. She certainly, I couldn't do some of the stuff. Even just crawling around the ground and fighting, it takes a lot you know, to do in a movie and, uh, and takes a lot out of you. So um, so here running up the wall and kicking, like it's, it's a great shot, but it's so goofy. Like, And that's when the movie is just like, from then on, it just it turns. Like, luckily, we have this scene here, which actually has a little bit of heart to it. Um, even though there's inconsistencies in this scene as far as the zombies, because the other zombies, they like... They move. I think they said something like there was. They try to put some logic. They they put all the the people who play zombies in this movie. I think most of them are dancers, and they they put them through like a zombie boot camp. But they try to come up with a logic for the zombies, which was the zombies move slow and they shuffle and they seem disinterested almost in a way of you at first until they get closer. And the closer they get to you, the more aggressive they get. The more they smell your blood, the more aggressive they get. And I'm like, yeah, that kind of plays for the most part in this movie. Like, there, it, it kind of plays out like that. But then you have scenes like this, boom, right through the, just for a jump scare. It's like, can he smell Matt through the glass? Um, because if he can, then this next scene makes even less sense. When he sees his sister and she's about, you know, five feet away from him and she is still shuffling towards him. So, and then the other parts where the zombies are just like they're right now they're just banging on the doors and you know uh you know while all these people are stuck in this room and uh, i don't know there's just a little just minor inconsistencies but again if you come up with a logic for something like that's a good logic okay they shuffle and then once they're near you and they can smell your blood or they whatever they'll attack but her right here she should be attacking like she's close enough to attack but but she's like she has this doughy eyed face she's sm almost smiling she doesn't look infected and then now she's <laughs> her gums are all gross and um yeah and she's not as dead looking as the others there's so many Alice in Wonderland references in this movie that I even think the paperweight that Mila just hit her over the head with is also an Alice in Wonderland paperweight <laughs> um this is where we start getting some flashbacks from Mila and she re she realizes that she knows Matt's sister um, and then so that to build the mystery of who she is, but again, that doesn't tell you anything about her character. I mean, okay, so Mila might have been responsible for the virus leaking out because she talked to her sister and her sister, you know, or Matt's sister and Matt's sister said, uh, her name's Lisa. I think the character's name is Lisa. And she says like, uh, you know, I need you to get me the virus. And Alice goes, I will, but you got to promise me something. You got to promise you'll take this corporation down once you have the virus. And, uh, and then Lisa goes, okay, I will. And so, so now Alice thinks, oh, is it me? Was I the one at the beginning who tried to sneak the virus out, um, and, and, you know, and smashed it and let it loose in this building? Like, would I have done that? And, but not for one second do you feel like she's the actual bad guy in this movie? Not one, not for one second. That would have been a great ending is if Matt and her were the two main characters and they start to build like a like a love interest almost throughout the story. And then at the end, Mila was the bad guy. Like <laughs> that actually would have been a twist and that would have been successful writing. Cause it would have fooled me. I would have been like, well, I didn't see that coming. Um, but, uh, whatever, like <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't go that route. Um, and then Mila proceeds to go through four more movies after this, where you just learn nothing about Alice as a character at all, like nothing of importance or substance and then finally in the sixth movie they try to give her a backstory and it's just the most stupid backstory ever uh, so we'll we'll get there we'll get there don't worry um this movie was up for a lot of awards uh, the golden schmoes award in 2002 uh, it was nominated uh, for best horror movie and best underrated movie um and best tna of the year 
um, for Mila Jovovich because she shows a nipple in one scene, and I think her vagina at the end of the movie um, is seen actually for a, a, a frame or two. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it was up for those. It was nominated but did not win. Uh, that's interesting. Who <laughs> best TNA of the year? And it didn't go to Mila. Mila's beautiful, by the way. And her last name is Jovovich. I think a lot of people say Jovovich. Even in the commentary of this movie, uh, Michelle Rodriguez keeps calling her Jovovich. And I love the joke where Mila goes, it's Jovovich. Like, I made a whole movie with you. How do you not know my last name? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's pronounced Jovovich. Uh, Mila Jovovich. Uh, but in also in uh, the first movie was uh, Best Actress. Mila Jovovich was nominated at the Saturn, the 29th Saturn Awards, and it was also nominated for Best Horror Film, uh, neither of which won, which, you know, I agree with. I think uh, there was a couple um, horror films in 2002. I mean, this isn't a, uh, essentially, this is not a bad movie. Like, I don't want, like, my, my, where I start to hate the franchise is after this movie. Um this movie didn't irritate me when it came out. Like I was like, all right, it's not great, but it, it wasn't so egregious to where I was like that mad. The only thing I hated was that the characters, I was just like, man, there's no one in here feels like a character from, you know, for more than like maybe one scene. And, and that's it. Like everybody gets kind of a scene to have a point of view or have a argument to be made, but then that's it. And that's all they get. And, uh, and it's, it's hollow. A lot of the times the arguments they have and the stuff they talk about is super hollow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's such a bummer. This, this, so this movie isn't the worst because unfortunately it gets way worse. Like when I saw this and it first came out, I think I remember being like, ah, okay, it's fine. Like I'll, I'll take it for what it is, but I hope they learn and listen to the criticism and, and develop the next film in a better way. And they, and no, they didn't like, not at all. They didn't at all. Um, I think this movie was, I think it was also nominated for the golden trailer awards for most original, even though it's based on a, a freaking, uh, um, you know, video game. But I guess the trailer was the most original. Uh, the trailer had a song in it that was by, um, bionic jive. Uh, it was called swarm. And I remember because, um, that's how I discovered the band Bionic Jive. Uh, lead singer Akko Mac, uh, who I'm a huge fan of, um, and he now goes by the rapper name Gorilla Monsignor, um, and uh, he, or Goliath Monsignor, Gorilla Goliath Monsignor, and uh, he. Uh, sorry, I was looking at a picture of Gorilla. I have Gorilla Grodd over on my desk because I've been reading Flash comics this week. Um, <laughs> Goliath Monsignor is his rapper name, and he's a. Uh, He's awesome. I'm such a big fan of Akko Mac and uh, kind of his lyrics. And when I heard the song on the trailer, I was surprised when the soundtrack came out. And this movie does have a good soundtrack. If you like rock music or like industrial rock music from the early 2000s, like Marilyn Manson, I think, does the score for this along with uh, Marco Beltrami. But there's also like Cold Chamber, uh, Fear Factory, um, Slipknot has the title song on this called uh, My Plague. There's also... Um, uh, who is it? It's, a. Uh, is it The Cure? I think does a, a cover song of Iggy Pop's Dirt on this soundtrack too. Um, or, uh, maybe it's not The Cure. Uh, I can't remember. Um, anyway, yeah, so uh, it's, there's, there's some great songs on this soundtrack actually. Um, but, uh, that song by, by Bionic Jive, Swarm, was not one of them. It was not on the soundtrack. And that, pissed me off so I found out the name of the song through um what was it like there was like there was Napster but it was after Napster it was like another file sharing service and all I did was I just used it to find music but I I worked at a record store so I mostly just bought you know records and and, and CDs and stuff with my employee discount um so I never had a problem I like I wasn't like a um, like stealing music but I would use it as a tool to find new music so I can find other bands out there that um you know that I might want to go see live in concert because I used to go to concerts all the time uh, around the time this movie came out so uh so yeah that's how I found Bionic Jive and then I immediately uh looked up you know when I was working at the record store I was like we got to find some of their albums and and I, we need to stock them here so I can sell them <laughs> and listen to them all day. And I, and that's exactly what I did while I worked there. Um, I, I 
ordered a couple of their albums and uh and pushed them as much as i could to people in greenville south carolina <laughs> um but uh yeah but yeah so if you like that kind of music you, you'll love the soundtrack to this movie and the second movie i think every movie after just has a score soundtrack I th- although i think a perfect circle has a song in the fourth movie um but it's not like an original song uh it's just a, a like it's a remix of one of their songs um so yeah in this scene here that when they're crawling down like michelle and um, Mila, they open up the door to look down into the essentially what's a sewer uh this area here they pretty much made because of the video games like they were like oh in the video games there's little hatches in the floor and that you can just crawl down ladders and get into like a completely different environment and then also because the second video game was very popular they're like oh we can do kind of a sewer environment with tunnels and stuff and so that's what they do is uh they that's what they did but i'm like how did the zombies get here it doesn't matter because they just use them for jump scares anyway um but the thing about this place is they have maps but you get like no real geography of the place and then right there you have a moment where the uh, literally a character can look at a map and go all right where are we let's figure it out and give the audience a little bit of geography and then it gets interrupted and although that's good as far as you know subverting expectations and catching you by surprise it works on that level but at the same time it's kind of like well we kind of want a little bit of information but uh but that's also they're trying to ramp up how desperate everyone gets you know at the beginning they were calm collected they were in charge they were in control they had maps they, they knew where to go and then you know this is now them well down the, the rabbit hole I mean, they spiraled way out of control now so it, it still works from a narrative standpoint but um but yeah there is sometimes that need for or want for information you're like oh you know i want to know the geography of this place i want to know where these tunnels lead how the zombies like follow them down here they they've only been down here for a few minutes if the zombies follow the scent of blood or whatever you know by that logic how could they have got down here so fast um and then this scene here where Mila's just doing kung fu moves and she she wraps her thighs around a zombie who could easily just turn, just bite her thigh <laughs> and infect her. But because she's Alice, she, no way. She's not going to get bit. She's not going to get infected. Cause when, cause they're, they're going to, they're going to give her the virus later and she's going to be superhuman. She's, she's the one, you know, like <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it, we'll get to that scene, but with the scene at the end where she's in the hospital where, where she, her, you get a peek at her vagina i guess uh that scene i I, after watching all six movies now i'm like why does that scene exist like what were they doing with her did they you know they say in the third movie or the second movie that they put a virus in her to to turn her superhuman but then they do that at the end of the second movie too but in a different way and using a different type of chamber and she has different kind of powers and it's just like, did they not know? And, and then when you get to the sixth movie and you find out that the guy in charge of all this knew that she was a clone and that he's a clone and that they're clones of people who do have power. You're just like, what? I mean, it gets so freaking stupid and convoluted. Um, but whatever. You know what? Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. I keep saying we'll get there. I keep t- teasing my frustration. Um, this shot's great. I love this where she's squeezing her hand and the blood's dropping and it makes them all more... F- uh, you know, kicked up in a frenzy. Um, uh, yeah, I like that shot where she's like, she's like, you like that? You like how it tastes? Um, you can tell she's starting to kind of lose it and they're all getting desperate. And this is when I think he kind of, he's starting to lose hope. This is, um, uh, Martin, I think is his name. Martin Cruz, I think is the uh, C R E W E S. Um, I can't remember the character's name he plays, but, uh, yeah, he's good. He's he's pretty good in this. But he again, he's like, all right, he's kind of the quiet, nerdy guy who has to step up and do something. But then he he kind of does. But it's a it's a nerdy thing that he does, which I guess is keeping with his character. But then he then he's disposable after that. It's like everybody. It's like all right, you're you're a character for a minute, and then then you die, um, or you do nothing for like twenty minutes, and then you die. Uh, that's kind of how they treat everyone in this movie um the way the t-virus works because i did have some people in chats before when i play the games ask me ask me like um how does the t-virus work you know if it if you if you're infected with it or do you just become a zombie instantly and uh, i don't think that's the case I, if i'm not mistaken in the first game 
there's an outbreak of the virus. It's you know, it's a it's a house like the one Mila is in at the beginning of the game. I mean, the beginning of this movie, she's in a mansion, and underneath it is a train that leads to a lab. That's not how it is in the video game. In the video game, there's a mansion, and underneath the mansion, directly under the mansion, is the lab, and it's a smaller lab. It's a much smaller lab. This lab here, the hive, that is the name they gave for the the lab in Resident Evil 2. So her train leads all the way to the city underneath Raccoon City and leads to that um, lab. So they kind of change the geography for the movie's sake. Um, but in the original game, I think the scientists that worked at the mansion, they got infected with the virus. They don't they don't say how in that game, but there was you know someone being you know careless is how they kind of describe it. We find out in Resident Evil Zero that it was a guy named Dr. Marcus who used to who helped found Umbrella, who was resurrected, and he was the one who caused the virus outbreak. Um, for to what end? I don't really know. I think just revenge on Umbrella, but it's like okay. Um, so anyway, he that's what kind of happens in the game. But in the way they were infected, they got they breathed it in, I guess, like, you know, went airborne. And it took some of them like weeks to die from it. Like basically they, they breathed it in. And because it's like a toxic virus, it kind of acted as like a flu at first. So they were like runny nose and colds. And then one guy, uh, the Keeper Diary, he describes that like a, a piece of flesh fell off his back when he was in the shower and that like a part of his heel was he was picking at it and it came off or something like that so it was like a really slow horrible death actually and then once they're dead once they died from you know being in, you know having that virus go through them and tear them apart then the virus really kicked in and reanimated their corpses um i think this this guy crawling up the pipe here to, to kill him is Dr. Blue. He was in the opening of the movie where uh, they got locked in the room that filled up with water. Um, so yeah, they all have like color names like red, blue, brown, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it worked in the game. So in the movie, it's kind of similar. Um, the halon gas that the team gets, or the, the that they get, they breathe in at the beginning, I guess there's a nerve gas that sends into the house and the train that just knocks you out. But then inside the um, I don't know, inside the lab here, like a halon gas came out, and I don't, see, I don't know too much about gases, so I don't know if that's a, a deadly gas, or if that's still like the nerve gas that Mila and this guy, James Purfoy, breathed in. I don't know if it's the same gas or not, but essentially it, it should have been a lethal gas, because it would have killed everybody, but then killing them reanimated them. <laughs> so, it's a dumb plan for the uh, for the Red Queen because the Red Queen's like, yeah, the virus got out, and so I, I just locked everyone down here. And it's like, well, why didn't you just lock everyone down here and not release any gas? Um, but it, it did, she did that so that way they would just be knocked unconscious until a team could come in and clean up the mess, I guess, was the whole point. Um, so I guess there's a little logic there, but um, but still it's like, I don't know. It's like, but if you knock them out, then the virus goes through their body faster because they're not active to like, you know, like, I mean, I guess your antibodies would still fight it to some degree. So they're not really clear on it in the movie. Um, but, uh, but typically the, the T virus, it can slowly kill you. Sure. Over the course of a few weeks. Um, but then it will reanimate you. Uh, so, but when you get infected with like a bite or something, I guess the virus goes through you much faster because um, if you're breathing it in it's going to take a while to adapt and, and build inside your body I guess and like I said it kind of starts like a flu and then it gets worse from there a bite or something goes right through your bloodstream and that's where the virus I guess does the most damage and so uh, I guess that's how like rain here for example is not taking three weeks to mutate and why some of those zombies still looked you know fairly clean as far as like decomposing goes because they've only been knocked out for a couple hours so um but then there was other ones that had like cheeks dripping off and like holes in their face <laughs> so so i don't know there's slight inconsistencies again you got to think about this stuff when you're making a movie and i don't think paul anderson does really i think i mean he does to an extent and i'm sure his team does 
but then when you're editing and cutting the movie together, you know, it, it kind of, you can kind of lose some of that. And, uh, so, uh, you know, it's not a hundred percent his fault or anything. I'm sure maybe on the day they were like, Oh, here's our logic. But then when it got to the editing room, they were like, well, unfortunately our logic is going to look incons inconsistent because we got to do, you know, we got to edit around this or we got to do this, or we don't have enough footage to make it look like this. And, and so sometimes that does happen. So you got to plan for that stuff. You know, when you're making a movie, you got to think, three steps ahead sometimes and I just don't think a lot of filmmakers do because they're just like eh it's a job and I'm I'm just trying to do it but I don't know if, you, if, if Resident Evil is your dream job then treat it like it's your dream job um so yeah uh, but the scene here where she's starting to get some of her memory back and she's like yeah blue is the virus and green is the antivirus in the video game there's not really an antivirus um there's herb which is only grown in Raccoon City, this type of herb, and that's kind of why Oswell E. Spencer chose Raccoon City to bring his virus to, because um, he was like, well, wow, there's this natural antibody on the, uh, you know, on almost the other side of the world from Africa, like, you know, growing here in Raccoon City that could um, stave off some of the infection on a, like a minor level. Um, but once you're infected, yeah, you can be too far gone to save, for sure. Um, I think Sherry Birkin in Resident Evil 2, she gets infected, the little girl, but she gets infected with the G virus, um, which is called the Golgotha virus or the God virus. Um, uh, T virus stands for tyrant virus. Uh, and so she's infected with something different and there is a specific uh, counterbalance to it because of her genetics. She's the she's a, uh, the daughter of the guy who is infected and who infected her with the virus. So they're able to counterbalance it. So that's like a special case. But, and then Jill, I think in the third game, she gets infected by the nemesis, which has the T virus. And I think Carlos is, is able to help her out as well. Um, so yeah, so those are like one off things, but I don't think they mass produce antiviruses. Uh, typically you'd think they would, but then when you find out in the sixth movie that they purposely wanted to infect the world, then you're kind of like, well, then why, why, why'd they make an antivirus if, if they wanted the world to be infected? I guess maybe just for themselves to have something in case they got infected, but they go through so many precautions to try not to get infected. It's so, it, it gets ridiculous. Um, but so here's where you find out that Spence, you know, uh, is the bad guy. And there's a continuity error there. The letter he just wrote is not in the same style as the one that was at the beginning of the movie. So like someone was not paying attention on that day for sure. Um, and, uh, this house that they filmed in the mansion was pretty cool. Cause it, there, it's kind of scary. I love that shot with his hand twitch. Actually, that's a really great shot. And it's funny cause that shot we just saw there where the door shut, that was in the trailer. And I remember pausing it and I saw his face clearly. So when I went into this movie, I knew he was the bad guy because the trailer showed that shot. I mean, typical Sony, right? Where they give away all their twists and their freaking trailers. Um, they showed that shot of him shutting the door and I paused it and I saw that actor and I was like, okay, yeah, he's, he's the one who leaks the virus. <laughs> like it was so obvious. So I, I never once thought it was Mila, um, at all. Um, but, uh, yeah, this, uh, this <laughs> Michelle there is actually, she does it. She has a look coming up that she does, which is, I got to give her credit for it. It's a really good non, and that's the thing is this movie has a couple moments where, like at the beginning, speaking of that letter, that's a continuity error. Mila at the beginning, she sees that letter and then she writes under it to see if her handwriting matches the handwriting that's above hers. Um, and I'm like, that's great. That's actually good storytelling. That's, that's her deducing stuff, figuring stuff out, um, and trying to see if maybe she wrote that letter. And when she sees that she didn't, she crosses it out. She's like, okay, it wasn't me. I didn't write it. So I got to, maybe I got to find the person who did. Uh, maybe I'm not alone in this house. And so I was like, yeah, that's, that's great. And like, that's actually a really good scene. And this scene coming up with Michelle, she's, they're going to like, they say something to her like, oh, she has to die. And she makes this face, uh, this facial expression. It's, it's really well done. Uh, I got to, like I said, I'm going to give credit where I, where I feel like it earns it. And, uh, and there are shots in this movie where it definitely does. But now we have James Purefoy, who plays Spence, who is a reference to Spencer, Oswell E. Spencer. So you, even from that, you kind of know he's the bad guy. Um, and plus, you rarely see things from his point of view in this movie. So that yeah, they, they kind of intentionally put him in the background for a while, just so 
you know, you don't think he's important, but it's it's so obvious that he's going to be the bad guy. Um, and this zombie here, I think she's the producer's sister or something like that. I think she's one of the producer's sister. Um, the lady who comes up out of the water behind Spence there. But he's given this whole speech about how, like, oh, we can sell the virus. And you can tell his words are agitating Eric Mabius. So I'm going to give him credit here for his reactions. Um, because every time he's, he's listening to this spiel and he's like, this is what my sister died for is some guy who just selfishly wanted to make, you know, millions of dollars by selling the virus to another company. And that was kind of the, the motivation of Wesker in the video games was he, he was, he wanted to take the combat data, data or data. Um, he wanted to take the combat data from the tyrant and the hunters and all the monsters that were down in the lab that he was experimenting on. Um, he wanted to take that data and bring it to like another company and, uh, sell it for, to someone who was a competitor to umbrella. And, uh, and that was like his goal. So they they still reference that here, like by Spence wanting to sell it on the black market. I'm like, ah, oh, that's kind of the motivations of Wesker. So they at least tried to have some things from the game here, but they just don't do it in any real interesting ways. Like they, they could have done more with some of this and, uh, they could have just made these characters feel like characters and they just choose not to. And then I guess because it worked where they were like, Oh, we can literally not like everyone can do well and act, you know, in the scene and in the moment as best they can with what they have. But since that was enough for audiences to make money, then we're going to just keep doing it. And it's like, yeah, but that just shows you the brand of resident evil. Like the fact that these movies were successful, but they were, they were terrible movies. Yes. Do these movies have fans? Absolutely. But are there a ton of them? Like, like there aren't, uh, no, there's half of the audience, at least half of the audience that went to see these movies were just regular Joe people who were like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm in for a dumb action movie. And then they see it and they go, eh, man, it was too dumb for me. But then like the fans of this movie or these movies and then the fans of the games, I think they're possibly the fans of the games outnumber the fans of these movies. I'm going to guess, but because the name resident evils on it, they, I think fans of the games are like, I kind of want to support it. Like, and that's why I saw, I've seen every single one of these movies in the theater and, uh, <laughs> I regret it. I'm the, one of the reasons why they keep making these movies. Um, that shot of the liquor is so, so cool. That scene where he's he's on the ceiling and he jumps down, that's straight out of the second video game. And then the scene where he's down in the sewers when he crawled past the wall, that's straight out of the, the second video game too. So, yeah, there's not, like I said, this movie has more good in it uh, than the other ones. But, uh, but I like things for characters. Uh, this makes no sense. This thing, it ate someone, and now it's mutating into, uh, as they put it, put it, a stronger, faster hunter. But yet, I wish they didn't use that word because it's it's there is an actual monster in Resident Evil called Hunter. <laughs> so for hardcore fans, it's uh it's not a generic or like they mean it in a generic way. But for hardcore fans, we're like, well, it doesn't look like a hunter. Um, and then also, I think it would have been neat to see it if it was going to transform or mutate, if it um stood upright, almost like a a child. Like it's like okay, or evolution in a way. It's like when it first comes out, it's, it's, it's kind of small. It's like three, three, four feet and it comes out and then I guess it maybe feeds on some of the undead creatures and it grows or just as time passes and it's running around looking for the survivors, it grows. Um, but then I would like, I would have liked to seen it just continue to grow and maybe even become like a tyrant like monster, uh, where it stood on two legs and, and had, uh, you know, it, one of the claws extend all the way to the ground like a tyrant. Um, I know that's not accurate to the video games either, but if you're going to have it mutate, have it mutate into something else recognizable from the video games and then having like a, a giant, you know, eight foot tall <laughs> lumbering monster with a claw arm. Oh, here's that look. Uh, there it is. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah, that was the look Michelle Rodriguez gave where she kind of raises her eyebrows and and I'm like, ah, such a good look. Michelle Rodriguez is just super beautiful. Um, I have had a crush on her since the first Fast and the Furious movie. Um, and uh, still do. She's awesome. She's an awesome person. She's a big gamer, too. I think she said if they made... She talked to her agent before this movie came out, and she said, look, if they ever make a Resident Evil movie, 
you got to get me an audition. I, I got to try to be in it. And uh, her dream came true. She's she's in this movie. So, uh, and then she came back for like the fifth movie too. So, you know, good for her. Um, it's again, like I said, the fact that she's a fan. And even Mila, I think her little brother was a big Resident Evil fan. So she got involved with this because of her little brother and um, and because he was a big fan of it. So, but I just I don't know why couldn't Mila play Jill Valentine? Like, why couldn't you just have made her Jill? And, you know, I mean, I know some people will be like, that's blasphemous. Jill needs to, you know, the girl who played Jill was great or, you know, whatever. It's like, uh, I don't know if she, she looked like Jill, the, the girl who plays her in the next movie. And we'll talk about that in the next movie. But, I mean, they don't really give her a lot to do either. Uh, Sienna Gl- Glory, I think her name is. Um, but she, yeah, she looks like Jill. But it's like if you're building a whole franchise around a character Jill is the most recognizable for the Resident Evil franchise. I mean, Claire's definitely a fan favorite, and uh, and there, you know, maybe Rebecca has her fans too. But you know, I like Rebecca personally. But um, but for Jill, is you could you could have made six movies, and Alice could have been Jill, and you could have gave her a real background. You could have made her like the Jill from the novels, where her dad was like a thief, and uh, and she decided to become a cop instead of going down the path her father went you could have actually you know done something made her some kind of character um and then she could have been like in way over her head and she could have been like yeah i'm special forces i'm trained but uh you know but this is another level like i'm not ready for this and it you know and i'm not a leader you know maybe i you know maybe she failed at trying to be the leader of stars a couple times and so this movie is about her stepping up and being a leader you know there, there's so many different things you could have done and they they just didn't they they went the least interesting boring uh least effort route with these characters and which is a shame because all these actors are good actors and i've seen them in other movies where they're very good so it it's it's a disservice to them to not give them real characters to play i feel uh this shot here they talk about on the commentary she has a plastic axe but it, of course a plastic axe will still hurt and she actually did hit uh, James Purefoy right in the head with that axe at full power accidentally she she admits it was an accident but I guess James Purefoy really hated the hell out of her for the rest of the shoot because of that um, so I guess they didn't get along after that day which makes sense I mean if I got hit in the head with something really hard um, I'm sure I wouldn't be happy about it either uh, but I do know accidents do happen um, unfortunately some really tragic accidents happen in future films um, like I said, Mila does all of her own stunts in these movies, except for the one when they're in the sewers, and she had to crawl across those areas with the, the pipes were, or not the pipes, but the um, cables were snapping, and then the cable snapped and the pillar went to the ground and she jumped to be caught. That whole scene, they actually used a stunt double because um, those cables could have snapped, in you know, because it's a wild card which way the cables are going to go when they snap, and they could have hurt her they could have wrapped around her neck they could have like sliced her arm off you know so they've had to put in a stunt double but that's my issue with these movies is that from the first movie here from that stunt onward they put stunts in each of these movies that could literally get someone killed for no reason like when you're making a movie you you, obviously everyone's trying to do their best they're trying to be safe they're all that stuff um but there's some stunts in these movies where they're like crashing cars into each other um, they're like flipping over helicopters or whatever they're running down the side of buildings whatever it is there's all these things in these movies that do not need to be in these movies at all they do not need to be they have no place in a Resident Evil movie uh, because Resident Evil 5 and 6 had really over the top action scenes 4 had them too but they, they tried to like spread them out a little bit 5 and 6 are just giant stupid you know, Fast and the Furious cartoon style movies uh, in a way with no real plot and everything and no real character development uh, for the most part. And uh, and I think that's where these movies devolved into. That's why they started making worse movies, I think, is because they were like, whoa, look look at the fifth video game and the sixth video game. And and, uh, they're just like these dumb, superficial, you know, uh, hollow stories for the fifth and sixth game. And that's what the movies became. So I feel like it's just the movies, you know, 
re if, if they're using the fifth and sixth game as their source materials, then yeah, they're going to make some really crappy movies uh, for sure that are even worse than this movie. And they do. Trust me, they do. It gets it, and it goes way downhill from here. Um, and then look, boom, dead. He, after, <laughs> after he uh, shut down the Red Queen, he had no purpose. That was his character moment is he decided not to be the coward and take the easy way out and then he comes in shuts the machine down and then boom no, no more purpose after that so we got to get you out of this movie because we got to get back to our two main characters who also now have no purpose other than to just shoot a monster and that's their purpose um they also do a terrible job in this movie of establishing exactly which blast doors that they need to pass through because they say, oh, you know those blast doors we passed through earlier? It's like, yeah, you guys went through like two or three different sets of blast doors. One of them which you used like a like a laser on to like cut your way in. But that they've already passed at this point. So they did a really bad job of telling you exactly where they needed to go in order to be out of harm's way. Um, and I wish they, you know, they could have done a little bit better job uh, as far as that goes. Because then at the end here, you're going to see them walk through a room and you don't even see the door shut. It's just a shadow because they couldn't afford a door that big. And so you're like, well, if you couldn't afford a door that big to show us shutting it and you didn't show it opening earlier, then how the hell do we know what blast doors you're talking about when you say you got to get out of here and get through the blast doors? Um, so, yeah, bad storytelling in that regard. And then you have Rain here. She got the antivirus, but she's too far gone. So obviously she's a zombie now. And this shot, we're going to get Matt. He's going to put her down. And like her eyes turned white. Spence's eyes turned like a glowing gray white. Um, I don't know why everyone seems to have a different reaction to the virus. Um, unless without establishing, like like I said in the video games, if you're you're like one in a million type of genetic makeup, you can become a tyrant. So it would make sense that you would mutate differently the way like Matt does at the end of this. Uh, when he, because he got scratched on the arm, little worms start growing out of his arm. And it's like, okay, that's different. We haven't seen that in this movie. So he must be one of those one in a million people, which is true because he ends up becoming the nemesis as we find out. Um, so this is essentially an origin story for a nemesis, um, which I'm not against. Like I wasn't mad at the end of the movie, although I hate the, the line that Jason Isaac says or whoever it says, they were like, I want him in the nemesis program. It's like, well... I don't think they called it the nemesis program. <laughs> like not to be, you know, I know that's a nitpicking really. That's a, actually, that's a big nitpick. Um, but I think it was the, the, he was called project nemesis after he was created, not before he was created. Um, but yeah, and even though there's very little blood in this movie, uh, because of the nipple shot and the vagina shot, they pretty much got nearly an NC 17 rating. So there were scenes of, more gore in this they had a cut i think paul anderson at one point said there's a director's cut of this movie that is gorier but they had to cut it down because they didn't want to get an nc-17 rating and, and at which point i would have been like well, why didn't you cut out the nudity like i know i mean mill is she's super gorgeous i get it like i know some people are like what are you talking about we want her naked in this movie F fine I, that, it's fine that you want that but still like yeah like when you're thinking about it commercially it's like yeah then take out the nudity because the blood is it, that's not going to get you an NC-17 rating. Although the ratings were a little bit different around this time. I mean, nowadays they could probably get away with more, but um, yeah. And because, like I said, the liquor, it, when it comes out of the machine earlier, it comes out of like a metal womb. So it would have been neat to see as it grew, if it grew into a man size, you know, a man-shaped size thing where it was like standing on two legs and, and had like claw arms, like, you know, like the tyrant did. Um, but here you have Matt mutating. And that would also explain, you know, because it mutates. Uh, and it still kind of explains it in this movie. Matt's mutating because the liquor itself mutates. Uh, he wasn't bit by a zombie. So he's having a different reaction. But if this reaction is, if everyone who gets sliced by a liquor has this reaction, then you would have like an army of nemesis. So again storytelling like explain why he's he's doing this why he's mutating this way um and they they don't they're just like they're just they had to get their nut off um you know and be like we got to make a reference we got to make a reference right now uh let's let's call him nemesis and uh like i said ultimately that concept i'm not against uh, i'm all for a origin story of nemesis so you can 
care a little bit about the human underneath and it humanizes nemesis because even though he's a monster that terrorizes you like that's what i loved res evil 7 did really well was when you start that game the bakers are just horrible horrible people that are trying to kill you and they're they're monsters they've killed numerous people there's like you know 30 people missing in the past like three years um because they just kidnap people and hurt them and, and and rip their heads off and do all these horrible things and they're just monsters. They're the Texas Chainsaw Massacre family. And then at the end of the game, you find out that they were being mind controlled and forced to do it by this Evelyn parasite. There's Jason Isaacs there, cameo. Um, I like Jason Isaacs. He's supposed to be playing Dr. William Birkin, but then they change his name to Dr. Isaacs in the second movie and have a different actor play him. Um, but it's supposed to be the same character. But I like Jason Isaacs. I wish he was available to play Dr. Burke and he would have been been great. And you could have done the story with him and Sherry and, you know, had some emotion to these movies. But why do that? Why, why do anything like that when you can just, you know, make something stupid and pointless um, for no with no effort? Like, and that's the other thing is there is effort. There's a lot of like movies are hard work. A lot of people put effort into this movie and it sucks when it doesn't show. Like when you're watching, I'm like, I know effort was made. I know everyone showed up and worked a 15, 16 hour day to make this movie every day, of, you know, for, for like months at a time, um, or for a year of their life or two years of their lives, they spent making this movie. And yet it's, it's like so forgettable on a lot of levels and so bad. You're just, yeah, it sucks because those people worked really hard. And again, this is my opinion. So if you're one of those people, if you just somehow someone out there who worked on these movies, hears this. Again, I'm not I'm not here to crap all over you. This is obviously just my opinion on some of the negative critiques I have, but um, I just feel like I feel like a better effort could have been made. I, I hate seeing things that I think are done at sixty percent when they could have been done at a hundred percent. And the problem is, is I bet you every scene in this movie was actually done at a hundred percent, but because the overall vision of this movie is not good or consistent. Um, it doesn't translate like that hard work doesn't translate on some of these scenes and it's a bummer and these the talent of the actors don't translate because they're not given anything real to act with um, so yeah and I don't think this is how card readers work but whatever it doesn't matter <laughs> it's a nitpick another nitpick I have a lot of those But, uh, yeah, as far, like I said, as far as Eric transforming into the nemesis, eh, that doesn't really make sense if you're following the game logic, which obviously these movies don't really care about. Um, but him mutating and a doctor seeing it and going, you know what, I, this is a unique mutation. Let's put him in the nemesis project to see if he could um, adapt to it or, or be a fitting candidate. Uh, I do like the holes in her head there. That's actually really well done. That's uh, it's pretty neat. But this scene here, this is pulled right from Day of the Dead. Earlier when the guy got pulled through the doorway, uh, JD, when he gets pulled through the doorway and eaten, it's from Day of the Dead. Like uh, Paul Anderson just has this hard on for just ripping things from other movies. And he says, oh, I'm paying homage, I'm paying homage. It's like, but you're not, because you're not subtly doing it. It's it's all, you, you're, this whole scene is framed around these shots that are straight out of Day of the Dead. It's one thing again if you want to reference the the video. There's a Stars logo on one of these cop cars, I think. Yeah, right there. Um, but it's one thing if you want to reference the video game because obviously that's the source material for this. And so he does a good job, like the scene where he where Mila kicks the 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 dog handler uh, when she I think his name's James Butler or something like that. Uh, he's like a stuntman when she kicks him there's a great angle that's over the top that looks down at, at at both of them while she's reaching for the gun in his lap. Uh, that's a shot lifted right from the game. And, uh, and that setup where you're like reaching for bullets from a zombie is from the game. And it's like, wow, that's great. Like, so I know he's capable of doing really great things, uh, with these, you know, with these movies and, and adapting the source material. But unfortunately he's, he's too big of a alien fan and a, George Romero fan and of course you want to pay tribute to George Romero in some way it's a zombie movie so you want to tip your hat to him in some way 
but he just pulls full scenes right out of those movies. I, th I think the third movie has a ton. It's basically the movie Day of the Dead is the third movie. It's like almost not beat for beat, but just like so many things in it are just lifted right from Day of the Dead. And you're just kind of like, I get it, man. You've seen whole zombie movies and you're a fan of 70s horror movies, which is why he wanted to end this movie on like a downer note. Because I think there there is this alternate ending where Milla walks into the Umbrella headquarters and like blasts a rocket launcher or something into a bunch of guards to, to break Matt out. Because she's like, oh, it's been six months and I'm trying to find Matt. And she's like on the hunt for finding her friend. It's it's a, not a bad ending. Um, I like that she has a goal. Uh, you know, at the end, she's like, all right, like I... I am a good person, and now I want to go save the other person that survived this with me who was also good. And then maybe that leads her to finding, you know, Nemesis, and then there's it could be tragedy there or whatever. They could have done stuff, good stuff like that. Let's see, here's all the doctors. Mr. Gray, because now we're in the, the credits. Cast in order of appearance. Mr. Gray, Mr. Red, Miss Black, Dr. Green. And the thing is that there's a Mr. Gray and a Mr. Red. I'm like, so is everyone down there not a doctor? So what the, what the hell are they doing there? Um... So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's someone's assistant, uh, you know, someone answers the phone. So, like, oh, I'm just Mr. Red because I answer the phones down here. Um, but, yeah, so anyway, we're in the credits now. They're playing the Slipknot song now. I think they also play a Cold Chamber song and a Fear Factory song. And if you listen till the end, you'll hear um, uh, Michelle Rodriguez's voice, I think, too, is they splice the scene in where she goes, I think I'm going to get laid tonight. They, they splice it into the Fear Factory song um, at a really good moment, too. So, yeah, they did a good job. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, good soundtrack, decent movie as far as like the look of it goes, but, uh, and, and the, what they were able to accomplish, which with a small budget, I think the budget for this movie was $33 million. And I'm pretty sure I know most movies spend their budget in marketing too, but I don't think they did for this one. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I don't remember this movie being heavily marketed. Um, and I don't remember them buying a lot of, uh, time, you know, like on, on different, networks to show the trailer and stuff i think they really hoped that the fans would would show up in droves and i think the fans did i think average moviegoers who probably recognized milla from um uh, fifth element probably came to see this and maybe people who just are like all right i'm down for a zombie movie but uh there were so many other better zombie movies that were coming out around this time like you know within a year or two of this film i think we had like 28 days later and stuff and it's just like we there was I don't think that came out before this I think it came out after but but still it was like this movie it it didn't really I know there'll people there'll be people out there that say this put zombies back on the map and stuff but it's like no because I feel like true zombie fans were playing the games already and that zombies didn't leave the 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 culture you know, the, the nerd culture at this time. So the movie didn't bring it back. Maybe it brought it back to some like average moviegoers, but I don't think it really brought it back to the, you know, fans. Cause I think most of them were probably playing the games anyway. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah. My mouth is dry. Cause I've been talking for like a, an hour and 50 minutes, um, straight with no water. And <laughs> you know, you know me, I don't, um, I try not to, uh, you know, drink or, you know, eat or anything like that when I, when I make videos or commentaries, because, uh, I find it unprofessional, uh, to be honest with you. Um, but, uh, I might have to have a bottle of water next time I do one of these because, uh, but hopefully next time, I mean, when I do the movie commentaries, we'll be talking for a long time, but when I do the game commentaries, I'm going to split them up into like 30 to 45 minute episodes. Uh, but speaking of, you're going to hear, now you're definitely going to hear sounds in the background. My dog is getting a drink. Uh, because he is an unprofessional a bastard. Um, and although I love him, uh, that sound right now is is not very good echo for this episode. <laughs> but of course he has to make a cameo because, you know, it's all about him, huh? Uh, the second unit director right there, Barrett Naluri, he actually worked with Eric Mabius in The Crow uh, Salvation, the third Crow movie. That's where I first came across Eric and became a fan of him. Um, Barrett Naluri was the director of The Crow 3, and I think they filmed it in Salt Lake City, I think is where they filmed that one. Um, but it had kind of a German, you know, horror vibe to it in some of the shots. Um, but it was cool that Barrett, uh, Barrett Naluri ended up doing second unit on this, and I don't know if he ever came across, uh, Eric Mabius on the, on the set of this movie, uh, but, uh, I, I, that would have been cool because I'm sure they, you know, they would have liked to seen each other again. Um, anyway, so 
we're wrapping up we're getting near the end this all the credits are almost over so I'll talk out through the credits and then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll continue talking for another minute or two after that to wrap up this episode but um I really do appreciate you guys listening to you know an hour and 50 minute you know podcast essentially uh, of me just talking about the Resident Evil movie um, I hope you did you know watch the movie while this was on but if not I try to talk about enough stuff to where um, you know you could just listen to it as a podcast and I try to include as much references and, and notes I took a bunch of notes and put them on my phone I didn't get to all of them but you know I kind of rambled and I go off on my own tangent sometimes and you know that's that's how I do and I think there was one cut in this episode and that was because my freaking AC came on so hopefully it's still lined up properly with the uh, you know with the the movie <laughs> hopefully I didn't uh, I didn't screw it up too much and hopefully I'm still you know the credits are ending right now the last line just went up just now so uh so hopefully this still timed out perfectly uh, but just in case it didn't you know i'm gonna talk for an extra minute or two just to make sure that that one cut worked out fine um but i will do more of these uh i'm you know i have a lot to say about these movies <laughs> i uh i have actual criticisms of them i know some people will be like oh you're just a hater and all that stuff but I try to have a reason for why I don't like something because again it's just my opinion like I may even when I give a reason I'll go like hey this is the reason I don't like it but you don't have to agree with that reason and you don't have to like my reason either um, so you know I open always open for a conversation um, if you're someone who is a fan of these movies and you like them because they're guilty pleasures or or you know they're you're just you genuinely like them you think they're fun and, and, and awesome that's great this isn't me you know crapping on your opinion please don't take it that way uh, this is me just wanting to talk about something I love like I love Resident Evil and I just see so many Resident Evil channels out there and I want to be a Resident Evil channel like I, there's there are many times where I was like oh man I, I, I have an idea for this and I have an idea for this and every time I've done something it's never really gotten views and it's never really took off and um, or I just never followed through with it and this time I was like you know what I I want to talk about the movies. I love the CGI movies, um, I, but I'm critical of those too. But I, but these movies I do not like, and I think I'm so I'm usually really positive on my channel, and that's why I thought it'd be fun to challenge myself to talk about something I don't like as much, but do it in a way to where I'm not just sitting around bashing these movies for an hour and a half to two hours. That's not what I want to do. Um, I but I want to kind of script out at least a couple of notes that I want to mention during my commentaries that are just about the universe itself or about the references you know and and kind of talk positively about some stuff too so that's kind of the challenge here was was me watch I wanted to watch this movie which is definitely the easier easiest one to watch out of all of them like I I I feel like I'm gonna have a lot of fun watching the fourth one but man do I <laughs> but I feel like I'm gonna probably rip into that one too um, but there's the fourth one there was there's so many things we're going to get into with the fourth one uh it's called afterlife um it's hard to keep some of these movies in order because they because they don't name them resident evil one two three four five and six which i wish they would have just done instead they gave them each subtitles in fact this movie resident evil one was originally called resident evil ground zero but they changed that because of the events of september 11th obviously because they filmed this and finished filming it in 2001 and uh and it was supposed to come out in the fall of 2001 and it got pushed back to like April of 2002 but then randomly they moved it up to March of 2002 like a last minute um, so uh, which ended up helping because the movie you know made money it might not have made money in, in April so it actually made money in March so good for it it gave it and it had some legs it did okay you know for the weeks after with a semi positive word of mouth from fans but yeah the critics ripped this movie apart and I could too but there's no uh, there's no talent in that either I, I think it's easy to pick these movies apart and trash them uh, and that's why I tried to do the opposite with this commentary track I didn't want to just sit and rip the movie apart that's it's low-hanging fruit as they say it's too easy um, but uh, I will probably definitely pick some of that fruit in upcoming movies uh, because uh, they get so bad after this so uh, it'll be fun but I appreciate you guys being here uh, we're at the one hour and 50 minute marker and I think that's a pretty good place to stop so if you enjoyed this commentary definitely you know like share subscribe all that fun stuff I'd love to have you come back I'd love to have you comment please tell me your thoughts uh, even if you leave multiple comments down below like as you're listening you comment as you're listening I know there's some people that follow me that do that um, anything you want like I, 
I'd love to see the interaction and maybe we can address some of your questions and your concerns in future episodes. But the next episode I do, like, let's see, I have a, so on my phone here, I have a, a little sheet that I have planned um, for this show, Nemesis. And so I have Resident the first movie commentary. That's this episode. We already did the Resident Evil 1 remake. So again, I'm going to put a link to that below. Um, it's on my uh, other channel. Uh, all these are going to go on my main channel now. Um, but uh, my Resident Evil 1 uh, remake commentary that I did a couple years ago, that's on my other channel. Um, so I'll link to that down below. The next episode of this that you're going to hear is the first like 30 or 40 minutes of Resident Evil 2, the remake video game. And I'm going to do a commentary track over that. But I'll probably post that the week I'm having surgery. So I already have nine episodes from Resident Evil 2 uh, between the main story of Chris, or not Chris, of Leon and Claire, and then all the DLCs. Um, I have nine episodes total. And those are gonna, all those are going to come out with commentary tracks over them. And those will probably start going up the week I'm having surgery. So I'm going to finish, I already uh, edited and uh, rendered all nine of them. So they're all done. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to schedule them for days during the week that I'm going to be on bed rest. So that way you guys have at least some content. I know it's not a Venom vlog. I know a lot of you guys are here for Venom vlog stuff, but I do want to try to commit a little bit of space on this channel for Resident Evil. And I want to do something different and I want to do something long form, you know, not something that's like quick and done. Like I, I love Where's Barry. He's my favorite YouTuber when it comes to Resident Evil stuff. And he does these really great two, three minute videos. But um, everyone else that's out there, like Residents of Evil and Let's Talk Resident Evil, I follow those guys. I'm subscribed to them. But ultimately, like, you know, I just don't want to do what they do. I want to do something different. And so these movie commentaries, I hope you guys enjoy. This one had no footage, obviously, because I don't want to get copyright strike. But the gameplay ones, uh, when I do Resident Evil 2, you will see visuals there. So you can watch that as, or listen to it as a podcast, or you can watch it on YouTube because there will be actual footage uh, and you'll be seeing what I'm commenting on. So those will be coming up uh, in the weeks uh, ahead. So thank you guys again very, very much. And let me know once again your comments down below. And we will see you all next time. Peace.